Belfast is unique amongst British cities in having paramilitary punishment squads that hand out summary justice. According to police statistics, between 1973 and 2004, there have been over 3,000 punishment shootings and over 2,000 beatings. There are as many attacks happening today as there were in pre-ceasefire Belfast over 10 years ago. In this program, we will look at the phenomenon of the punishment attack. It's not a smack on the back of the hand. It's shot to the legs. And we meet the people who've been on the punishment squad's hit list. My kneecap was blue in half. AK-47. You're caught. You keep your mouth shut and take a beating. <laughs> Belfast has witnessed over 30 years of violence between Catholic Republican and Protestant loyalist paramilitaries, making the city notorious not just in the UK, but the whole world. When we had an explosion of violence, the fabric of society begins to rock. Punishment-style beatings and shootings have been part of life in Belfast since the outbreak of the Troubles immersed the city in violence in the late 60s. The 1994 ceasefire saw an end to the tit-for-tat sectarian killing. The ceasefire did not, however, bring an end to the punishment beatings. Belfast's ambulance service witnessed some of the most brutal and calculated violence in Britain. Paramedic Terry Gorman have been working in Belfast for 17 years. It's quite often you don't know what you're, what you're going to find until you get there. I remember one of my very, very early, early incidents where I went out to a shooting and I jumped out of the ambulance only to find that we had three filler ones lying side by side. A nice wee row had all been kneecapped. Shot in each knee and shot in each ankle and shot in each wrist. It was something that I wasn't prepared for in the training school but it's something that you, you learn from. I remember responding to a call in this area. It was mid-afternoon, 3 o'clock or so. Both people, as far as I can recall, had sustained lower limb fractures, quite nasty, horrific injuries, and kids had quite obviously seen the victims. It was quite possible that they had also seen the attacks been carried out. It was diabolical. It was a very sad indictment of, of the people of Belfast. The back alleys of Belfast are often the place where punishment attacks are dealt out. Community worker Brendan Bradley agreed to show us round an area of North Belfast where friction between paramilitaries and local youths is high. FTRA means fuck the RA, fuck the RA. That's one here, drug deal like fuck. I suppose that means that anybody who wants to do a bit of drug dealing can go ahead and uh, deal it because the, the young people around here believe it's the right thing to do. As we are filming, Brendan sees some youths vandalising a fence in the deserted estate of Torrens. What is that? That's a moment. The boys start to hide their that? faces and ask not to be what? filmed. They claim to be helping building, local builders. Why is that at school? Put that camera there. These boys set the houses on fire. People asked us yesterday if they take them off for them. Just to get rid of them off, get them all off to make less work. Well, if they're into helping that, there's good, but we beg to differ. They're pulling off the wood to bundle it up, throw it into the house and set it in fire. The nervousness of the boys is understandable. Nearby is a place favoured by paramilitaries for carrying out punishment attacks. This alleyway here is synonymous with punishment beatings and kneecappings. It's commonly known as a kneecapping alley because of the many people that's been punished here. Neighbours said when some of the beatings were going on, they heard the people being beat and basically they, they, they couldn't they couldn't respond. Obviously the, the, the self-preservation was one of the things that they thought about. One punishment victim that came to know Kneecap Alley was ex-offender Jimmy. I had no job. There was no jobs about. That's where it started. I was doing robberies, doing various other things. They were, they were just money makers. As Jimmy became known for robbing post offices, the local paramilitaries began to take notice. There were a lot of robberies going on around the district. Um, my name was put amongst them names. This fella came up to me. He said, there's a, there's a girl that wants you outside. 
That was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life when I got the top of the stars. Jimmy was severely beaten. But his ordeal was far from over. They only took me 200 yards away. When I was at a local school, she had a couple of hands and told me to, to kneel down. It was just around this area where I could have me down. They put their guns back in my legs and then shot me. And then they shot me that leg. It was freezing. They let me down for about a half an hour before an ambulance came. Ah, thought I was going to die. My kneecap was blue in half on my right leg. I had a broken femur on my right leg. And a shattered, shattered chin on my right leg. On my left leg, my kneecap was uh, shattered. All the arteries and tendons severed on my left leg. I mean, that's when I was only 18, like. The infamous kneecapping is a classic form of paramilitary punishment. But the range of punitive measures can be diverse. For first-time offenders, public humiliation can be used, such as being tied up and covered with tar and feathers. It can also be as simple as having to advertise one's crimes in the high street. For more serious offences, injuries will be inflicted with carefully aimed gunshots. Or in the case of beatings, more barbaric methods will be used. The punishment will often be worse for repeat offenders. Three years after being beaten and kneecapped, the paramilitaries had reason to visit Jimmy once again. I was having a, a whole new different kind of crime, which is selling drugs. They'd been looking for me for a while. I managed to evade them a couple of times, but I was stuck away in the car. It was not clean out. I would say I would have been more or less unconscious, but in, in my mind, I could hear and feel everything that was going on. I mean, I felt all the blows I was taking. I heard them hanging on around me. I could hear, I could hear my, my bones cracking. I still remember them all. Them all laughing like animals. Bottom half of my leg was mangled, fragile skull. My arm was mangled, ribs. And I'm led to believe it, a pig axe put through my leg. Eight senses. The sales were selling drugs. Regardless of whether I was selling drugs or not, I still don't get them right to beat me. I'm not sure. It's life. Although the nature of punishment attacks seems barbaric to a civilized society, the call for such actions come from the communities themselves. Complaints from residents will be passed on to representatives of paramilitary groups who will then investigate the individuals concerned. Mondays are terrible days for paramilitaries because that's the day after the weekend and there's usually a queue of elements of the community demanding that this person or that person be dealt with. The heavily fortified police stations in Belfast reflect the police force's vulnerability in the past. The authorities today are still treated with a level of contempt and distrust. The police, it would seem to me, do not do the small things well. This is the first question I ask uh, the little old lady who comes to my constituency office uh, is, have you phoned the police? Yes, I phoned the police and they didn't respond until four hours later. The lack of a fully accepted police force is what allows paramilitaries to gain support from communities and still maintain a role in society today. Our local people who know their own community so well that they actually can blend into it so easily and can actually have people who want them to do this. The paramilitaries do not trawl the street looking for people to punish them big. All of the paramilitaries, no matter which colour they may be, have always indicated that they were the defender of the people. Although paramilitaries are seen as the enforcers of law and order in certain parts of Belfast, the police, of course, do not accept their self-appointed position. 
by using the term punishment beatings. Prosecution for punishment activity is extremely rare. Of the 1,200 punishment attacks made in the last five years, less than 2% led to arrests. The victims of those attacks are very much living in fear. I remember going to the scenes of a paramilitary attack on a young boy. But as police arrived at that scene, that young boy was screaming for us to go away. And it was clearly because if he was seen to cooperate with the police in any way, that there could be further retribution. Years, either to keep discipline within their ranks or through public pressure to reduce antisocial behavior. In Belfast today, at the top of the punishment squad's hit list are joyriders. Joyriders annoy and upset and torment the whole community because of the noise, the screeching brakes. Very, very many people in the community can't sleep. The city has a huge problem with car theft, but mostly it's not for profit, it's for fun. Foxwells, built by robots, driven by joyriders. <laughs> we tracked down one ex-joyrider who agreed to talk to us about the conflict with the paramilitaries. He asked to remain anonymous. This place here would be my old hunting ground. It was a bit of a rally course. He around the gates with a stolen car, flew in and showed off. What makes people do it is lack of things to do in the community. It's like a sport. The Joy Raider gets a buzz. The police drive big 4x4 jeeps. They can't take bands at 50, 60 mile an hour. So you know you're making a mockery out of the police. When you're taking a chase by the police, they're getting respect from your friends. Well, respect's everything. The biggest demand for punishment beatings would be in relation to joyriding. Many people are afraid of joyriders knocking down their children. This has happened in West Belfast. Children have been killed. In 2002, Jim McComb lost his daughter, Debbie, to a reckless joyrider. Ever since, he's been battling to increase sentencing for joyriders that kill. They're killing them. They're taking limbs off. They're hurting people. The judge has got the part in their hands. The hand that 10 years sentence said 15 years ago. And they're not. I shouldn't have got go to paramilitaries. The number one enemy would be the paramilitaries because they would also get a lot of complaints about joy raiders. I've seen people getting their legs broke with baseball bats, getting shot, tortured, guns put to their heads, glad on they were getting shot so they could give information about other joy raiders. Pressure on local paramilitaries in one area of South Belfast brought about one of the most shocking punishment beatings in recent times. Convicted car thief Harry McCartan from West Belfast had been punished with broken ankles in the past by Republican paramilitaries. Having recovered from his injuries, he was thought to be active in a loyalist area in the South. Here the repercussions would be far worse. Crime reporter Henry MacDonald covered the story. It's clear that the paramilitaries got complaints from local people living in this area. The UDA, they waited, they caught Harry McCartan, but rather than do anything to him in such a public, large road where, they, where there may be police patrols, they took him to a quieter place. He was dragged down this road here to this very spot. It doesn't look very significant, but in fact this is where Harry McCartan was effectively crucified. When we arrived here after he was taken away in ambulance, there was blood stains all over, all over the wood. It was quite obvious what had happened. Such was the ferocity of the attack that instead of just being another statistic, it made national headlines. He was taken to hospital with the nails and wood still attached to his hands. It took surgeons five hours to remove them. The loyalist paramilitaries want to send out a message to other joyriders in the west of the city, which was, don't come into this estate to steal cars. Come in at your peril. The message was meant to be clear, but the victim himself remained defiant. I don't know what I did wrong, but what they done wasn't right. Despite the horrific injuries, feelings for the punished joyrider in the community were mixed. Many people in the nationalist community would have little sympathy for Harry McCartan. Count himself lucky that the nails were driven through his hands rather than his head. I knew Harry McCartan and he didn't deserve what happened to him. Who in the right mind agrees when they own somebody to offence? Don't agree with it when they nail Jesus to a cross. For Jim McComb, it's a dilemma whether or not the punishment was deserved. I don't believe 
I don't like my paintings, but I don't believe it. Actually, I, I don't. But maybe it stopped him from killing an innocent person, that not So that's the way it is. The level of paramilitary activity varies across Belfast. I don't agree with it when they nail Jesus to a cross. For Jim McComb, it's a dilemma whether or not the punishment was deserved. I don't believe the punishment being in this world. I don't believe it. Actually, I, I don't. But maybe it stopped him from killing an innocent person, didn't it? So, that's the way it is. The level of paramilitary activity varies across Belfast, depending on the area's relationship with the police. The Ardoin in North Belfast is one area where trust in the police is so low that paramilitary activity is very high. Once a police service has the trust and the backing of a local community, the role of the paramilitary tends to decrease. At the moment, in many national series, including this one, there is not an agreed trust and an agreed mechanism to engage with the police. And so the paramilitary still would be, in the many, many people, the custodians of order. In the past, paramilitaries have been seen as men of honour within communities. But recently in the Ardoin, support of their actions has been questioned. This is like Marlboro gangsters, mafia. They're hoods, hoods with guns. Angela Kern's son Barney received an extremely harsh punishment for a relatively minor offence. Barney was standing down the street with a can of beer in his hand, and this guy approached him, said to Barney, move on. And Barney says, well, why would I move on? I'm, I'm only standing here having a can of beer. He got Barney by the neck, gripped my Barney by the throat, and Barney lashed out and smacked him one on the face. And he said to him, right, Kearns, you'll see what will happen to you. Two to three weeks later, my son was talking about them, nine of them, nine of them. And they were taunting Barney even in the house before they shot him. Barney, it's your birthday. I'm going out to play, Barney. And then they took my son away and shot my son down here at the back of me where I live and they made sure that they destroyed my child's legs. The victims of punishment attacks can be left with not only severe physical injury, but also mental images that never fade. The scars do heal, but I have a lot of memories locked away in my head where this will never go away. Sometimes you're afraid to sleep at night. You're always checking the windows, locking doors, and you've always got an escape route. The first thing you do when you walk into a house is you plan your escape route. That's the way you have to live here. A year after his punishment beating, Barney's friend, Anthony O'Neill, committed suicide, having also received a beating from the local paramilitaries. Barney went to the funeral. I feel very involved for the reason that I had preached at the funeral that morning, and I had a feeling in my bones that there's going to be something else that's going to happen here. And I did something on the spur of the moment. I asked any young person in the church who had a mobile phone with them to take it out and to put my number, my mobile number, into their phone. If there's ever a moment when you feel there's nobody else I can contact, here's one number. And yet within a few hours of preaching in that vein of hope, help, I get a phone call to say there's somebody hanging from the scaffolding. On the 14th of February, this was completely covered in scaffolding. I had to climb the tower of my colleague, Father Gary, because we heard that somebody was up there and we went up. He was too far out to actually touch him for fear he would fall off the piece of scaffolding. But we gave him the last rites from where we were. So I climbed all the way down the scaffolding again because a huge crowd had gathered at the base of the church here. And I'll always remember that the first person I met was this man. He stepped forward and he said to me, you've just come down from the scaffolding. What was the young man wearing? And I told him it was jeans and a striped shirt. He said, that's my son, Barney. Many suicides have been attributed to paramilitary activity in recent years. Barney's was the 11th suicide by a young person in Ardoin since the new year. It was February. They murdered my son. They may as well have took Barney up there. They may as well have pulled up all what they said. When you punish by violence, you end up 
either breaking a person, as we've seen in the case of suicide, or making them more determined than ever to go on and just show how bad they can get. So I myself have, have lifted patients off, off the streets where they have visible tattoos, and these tattoos say, shoot here with an arrow pointing towards the kneecap. Getting a punishment beaten doesn't prevent joy raiding at all. It just makes people more bitter and angrier. Police service in Belfast is completely accepted by communities. The paramilitaries will still be looked upon to punish unruly youths. Having fully reformed from any criminal activity, Jimmy now volunteers for a local community centre, helping young people avoid trouble. The best thing to do with any young person is just listen, tell them. I don't have their say. I never got the chance to talk to anybody. That's just what they're closing, beating. Sad. Support for paramilitaries is what will keep summary justice a reality in Belfast for years to come. A recent television poll in Northern Ireland found that 65% of respondents felt that punishment attacks did work. Did people say to the paramilitaries, please, the time has come when we don't want anything else from you, then the paramilitaries will not be able to function. They may regroup for another purpose, but they will not be the defense of the community. Until that time comes, Belfast will keep its reputation as one of Britain's toughest towns. It was deserved. I don't believe the punishment beat in this world. I don't believe it. Actually, I don't. But maybe it stopped him from killing an innocent person, didn't it? It's true. That's the way it is. The level of paramilitary activity varies across Belfast. The Don't agree with it when they nail Jesus their cross. For Jim McComb, it's a dilemma whether or not the punishment was deserved. I don't believe the punishment being this world. I don't believe it. Actually, I, I don't. But maybe it stopped him from killing an innocent person, didn't it? It's true. That's the way it is. The level of paramilitary activity varies across Belfast, depending on the area's relationship with the police. The Ardoin in North Belfast is one area where trust in the police is so low that paramilitary activity is very high. Once a police service has the trust and the backing of a local community, the role of the paramilitary tends to decrease. At the moment, in many national series, including this one, there is not an agreed trust and an agreed mechanism to engage with the police. And so the paramilitary still would be, in the many, many people, the custodians of order. In the past, paramilitaries have been seen as men of honour within communities. But recently in the Ardoin, support of their actions has been questioned. This is like Marlboro gangsters, mafia. They're hoods. Hoods with guns. Angela Kern's son Barney received an extremely harsh punishment for a relatively minor offence. Barney was standing down the street with a can of beer in his hand, and this guy approached him, said to Barney, move on. And Barney says, well, why would I move on? I'm, I'm only standing here having a can of beer. He got Barney by the neck, gripped my Barney by the throat, and Barney lashed out and smacked him on, on the face. And he said to him, right, Kearns, we'll see what will happen to you. Two to three weeks later, my son was talking about them. Nine of them. Nine of them. And they were taunting Barney even in the house before they shot him. Barney, it's your birthday. I out to play, Barney. And then they took my son away and shot my son down here at the back of me where I live and they made sure that they destroyed my chain's legs. The victims of punishment attacks can be left with not only severe physical injury, but also mental images that never fade. The scars didn't heal, but I have a lot of memories locked away in my head where this will never go away. Sometimes you're afraid to sleep at night. You're always checking the windows, locking doors, and you've always got an escape route. The first thing you do when you walk into a house is you plan your escape route. That's the way you have to live here. A year after his punishment beating, Barney's friend, Anthony O'Neill, committed suicide, having also received a beating from the local paramilitaries. 
Barney went to the funeral. I feel very involved for the reason that I had preached at the funeral that morning and I had a feeling in my bones that there's going to be something else that's going to happen here. And I did something on the spur of the moment. I asked any young person in the church who had a mobile phone with them to take it out and to put my number, my mobile number, into their phone. If there's ever a moment when you feel there's nobody else I can contact, here's one number. And yet within a few hours of preaching in that vein of hope, help, and I get a phone call to say there's somebody hanging from the scaffolding. On the 14th of February, this was completely covered in scaffolding. I had to climb the tower of my colleague, Father Gary, because we heard that somebody was up there, and we went up. He was too far out to actually touch him, for fear he would fall off the piece of scaffolding. But we gave him the last rites from where we were. So I climbed all the way down the scaffolding again, because a huge crowd had gathered at the base of the church here. And I'll always remember that the first person I met was this man, he stepped forward, and he said to me, you've just come down from the scaffolding. What was the young man wearing? And I told him it was jeans and a striped shirt. He said, that's my son, Barney. Many suicides have been attributed to paramilitary activity in recent years. Barney's was the 11th suicide by a young person in Ardoin since the new year. It was February. They murdered my son. The men as well have tucked Barney up there. The men as well have pulled a ball up me head. When you punish by violence, you end up either breaking a person, as we've seen in the case of suicide, or making them more determined than ever to go on and just show how bad they can get. And I myself have, have lifted patients off, off the streets where they have visible tattoos, and these tattoos say, shoot here with an arrow pointing towards the kneecap. Getting a punishment beaten doesn't prevent joy raiding at all. It just makes people more bitter and angrier. Police service in Belfast is completely accepted by communities. The paramilitaries will still be looked upon to punish unruly youths. Having fully reformed from any criminal activity, Jimmy now volunteers for a local community centre, helping young people avoid trouble. The best thing to do with any young person is just listen to them. Let them have their say. I never got the chance to talk to anybody. That's just what they're closing. Sad. Support for paramilitaries is what will keep summary justice a reality in Belfast for years to come. A recent television poll in Northern Ireland found that 65% of respondents felt that punishment attacks did work. The people said to the paramilitaries, please, the time has come when we don't want anything else from you. Then the paramilitaries will not be able to function. They may regroup for another purpose, but they will not be the defense of the community. Until that time comes, Belfast will keep its reputation as one of Britain's toughest towns.